Welcome to the Theocracy Podcast. Previously, I'd say you're a brave soul to start listening to an episode over two hours long, but these long discussions, which I like to call Theocracy Councils, have actually been the most popular. So I have several new ones in the works now. This first one in the new series is a bit slow, but if you'll give it your time, there are indeed some nuggets in here. I think at the least you'll find it a bit more fiery because of some opposing viewpoints, shall we say. The next one will get into a lot more specific laws and examples. Topics and questions that we cover are, how does Paul use the law? Is the threefold distinction of the law a cop-out? The threefold distinction being moral, civil, and ceremonial. What's the law's role in evangelism? What basis do I have to confront a neighbor who often gets drunk? What was Jesus' ultimate problem with the Pharisees? Isn't it dangerous to let the law be applied only by quote-unquote experts? If we focus on the Spirit, doesn't obedience to the law take care of itself? How did Jesus transform the law by establishing it? How do we win favor with outsiders in how we apply the law? When is caution in establishing the law not even a concern? Is it useful to categorize the law? And how do we encourage unbelievers to willingly ask us to teach them and apply the law? If you'd like to leave a review for the show, it helps more people find it. Uh, I think there are a couple on iTunes. I also ask for a dollar a month to listen to the show if you'd like to become a supporter. You can set up auto payment on voluntarytheocracy.org using dollars or Bitcoin. If you'd like to donate something else or if you'd like to drop me a line, you can email T-H-E-E-O-C-R-A-T at gmail.com. Theocrat with two E's at gmail.com. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Tell me a little bit about um, why you said yes to come. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's your what's your interest and in maybe what's your background in terms of the subject of theonomy or law and gospel? Right. You want to start, Mike? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I said yes because I wanted to hang out. And, uh, Fair enough. <laughs> and I'm interested in the topic of theonomy and theonomists. Um, I am coming at it from sort of the opposite angle where um, I don't think that um, Christians are under the law and I don't think that uh, Christian societies are under the law or Christian rulers or anything like that. And so I'm very interested and intrigued by claims. Mm from the, you know, opposing angle, and I want to hear their arguments and see uh, what the reasoning is and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. I respect that a lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm honored that you come. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Hey, I'm Dennis. Um, 
I've always been intrigued by theonomy. I've, I've met Greg Bonson. He's preached at our church back in Blue Belt, Pennsylvania. Gave lectures back in the 80s, early 80s. I don't know, somewhere in the 80s. Um, so I've met him, met you know, him when he was being considered to replace John Frame at Westminster, the stuff, you know, things like that. So I've, I'm aware of that. I'm, I have a very broad, broad familiarity and sympathy with that position. Never, never impressed by the Kleinian Escondido arguments, but, mm. so, but that's a large part. What, uh, what's unimpressive to you about? About theonomy? About, well, about, or what's, I guess, what's unimpressive to you about the, the opposing side? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure with Klein if we're actually ever dealing with the present world. He okay. seems more, as, as I was reading Bonson's reply to Klein's article way back, way back when he gave his definitive answer to theonomy and said, well, the Westminster Confession supports you guys, but you really are, you're really unbiblical and any covenant child would know better. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it, you know, I, I, just yeah, I just been obviously moving out here to Moscow um, with Doug, who, is, who certainly has broad theonomic mm. um, sympathies and positions and things like that. So to even move out here is already to, to at least be embracing in broad strokes, unless you're just here for the classical only, and then you're mm. going to leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, he's he's got a couple different fronts. He's got people coming in on, and but still, it's. Uh, in a nutshell, that kind of thing. Okay. Jacob? Well, yeah, so... Um, well, and you and I met in the, was it the Christian Anarchist yeah. group? And yeah. I don't consider myself an anarchist, yeah. sir, for everybody listening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the yeah name good of the thing. podcast is Theocracy, for heaven's sake. <laughs> right, so you're not a moderator, I guess, then. No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Well, why would they even have a moderator for a Christian anarchist group, right? Ideally, you wouldn't want one, right? Yeah. You wouldn't uh, need one most of the time. Yeah, I mean, of course, I say that tongue-in-cheek. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would, I guess I represent the post-structuralist uh, perspective on interpretation. Uh, post-structuralism is just um, a... Methodology, a postmodern methodology for interpretation that is that attempts to deconstruct meanings and in, um, intent and literature and intent uh, mm -hmm. based on a, um, a relativist position, um, a subjectivist take on uh, texts, and so. Uh, but I do so as a Christian, right? As a Christian who believes in the Word of God. Um, but I, I just understand a text to be more malleable than we uh, often allow them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I have always been in churches that have been familiar with the theonomic position because of the relationship to, say, Greg Bonson. Uh, I have family members who went to seminary with Greg over at Westminster East, and I, um, um, I've heard um, people who are um, within the legacy and heritage of Greg Bonson's foundation, the Greg Bonson Foundation, Covenant Media Foundation. Uh, I... I when I worked for them for a while um, at their OPC church down in um, Chula Vista. And so I've been in these circles, right? So these things have been hashed out over and over and over uh, in front of me, and I've had a long time to consider them. It doesn't mean that I have a, a thorough or deep understanding of them, but I'm familiar enough with these topics and, and the use and misuse of terms that I feel like can maybe add to a conversation. So when someone wants to meet and talk about these things, uh, it's interesting for me to listen to them and to maybe um, add something helpful. Um, but to, to be honest, I think that in this particular area, you said you moved here for you know the community to some extent, right? Uh, I think that a lot of these topics have been discussed uh, from from, I think from a lot of perspectives ad nauseum, I mean, for a lot of people in the community, uh, and it's not that they that they don't come up, but they 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 come up I think 
uh, in different ways nowadays, um, in, in maybe issues of practical theology or maybe other areas of, of discipline. The, the theonomic position is part of a larger context of other positions and other debates. And so uh, I'm always interested when someone's maybe going back to like the source discussions. And so that's another reason why I thought it would be good to come. Okay. Um, I guess to give a little bit of my, my perspective on it as well, I think, well, the idea of theonomy, I think it was uh, R.C. Sproul that, that wrote an article about it, which is like, what is theonomy or what does it mean to be a theonomist? And he said, like, broadly speaking, it just means that you have a positive view of God's commandments. Hmm. And like, in that sense, who who isn't a theonomist? But in another sense, the, oh. the discussion is always, well, okay, but what does that look like or what does that mean when you when you get down to brass tacks right. um, and then I heard this was probably four or five years ago I think I heard Doug talking about Doug Wilson talking about the army and he was like well God's law is eternal and unchanging it's the application that can change because obviously Hebrews talks about mm -hmm. when there's a change in the priesthood there's necessarily a change in the law as well we went from a Levitical priesthood to a Melchizedekian priesthood, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? We don't have any of that stuff detailed for us. You know, well, where do we go and look that up? Uh, I, well, I feel like it's pretty clear in you know the Gospels and in Galatians what exactly what it looks like, which is you know that there's no more you know, ordinances apart from the most general sense of love God and love your neighbor. Uh, right. I think I think all. And the way Paul talks about the law being a guardian whose time is now over, uh, and you live by the Spirit now instead of the letter, which you know was only ever you know uh, inciting you to more sin and failure, and so you get to you you're not bound by that anymore. Um, Mike, Michael, just a real yeah. quick question: Would you say that in in the New Testament there are times that the the writers make reference to the law um, it, where they're not speaking specifically of the letter of the o Old Testament hmm. but rather um, something something else oh, what would you mean by that specifically um, well I, I, I think that probably it could mean lots of different things but I think right. that there's that there's many times the word law is used in the New Testament hmm. where it's not referring to say uh, the Torah, or it's not okay. referring to say the ceremonial law, mm. or it's not uh, necessarily referring to um, like the Deutero canonical, the the um, Deutero Deuteronomy's laws. Yeah. They're the law for the, the civic law. Yeah, right for the people of Israel. Right. So do you think that that that, that there's enough variance within the New Testament where uh, the word law is used? Um, in a different way from those um, ways of speaking. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. My my impression is from the New Testament that um, when the the law is being described, you know, I, I think he means just uh, you know maybe you can broaden it to the. Uh, testimony of the Old Testament, but it seems like it's specifically the Mosaic Law and everything. That's contained. the primary usage, yeah. for sure. Yes. Yeah, everything contained within that. And, you know, Protestants are going to divide that into, well, there's the ceremonial law and the moral mm -hmm. law mm -hmm. and the civic law and all this sort of thing. I'm I'm a little bit skeptical of those divisions. I don't know. I, you know, it makes sense that they make those divisions. It does seem like different things fall under those different categories. But also, just seems like they're the ones inventing that distinction um, doesn't mean it's totally wrong but I don't know if everything is going to be cut and dry where some things are going to you know have ceremonial moral and civil implications um, yeah it's sometimes hard to make those distinctions exactly um, yeah. it, it, depending on the context for sure right. And it's interesting that you would bring those up because I think we would have opposing viewpoints on this, and I also mm -hmm. don't see a distinction between the three. Right, right. I, I, I've, I've sort of wondered about that hermeneutical tool. Of, it does seem to be yeah. kind of a get out of jail free card. Of, was oh, it? We can just kind of 
shuffle certain things under this category, but then other things. Are under right. It's category. a way to it's a way to ignore certain parts and hold other parts a little bit more highly in high regard. Unless unless you do what I think is what Calvin and Luther are doing. I read a great paper by uh, Avis on this on the reformers, Continental and English. Uh, Stephen Wedgworth um, uh, recommended this essay to me, where basically he goes through and shows, you know, for the most part, it seems that the Christian tradition, um, uh, whether you know medieval and going into the Protestant uh, era, you know, was pretty, you know, there there were arguments and there were distinctions um, being made among them, but they were all more or less had a consensus. Uh, on the fact that uh, the law is no longer binding on Christians, um, it existed as a guardian, uh, but now the only part that is binding is um, the natural law insofar as it's found in uh, the Mosaic law, and, and for, you know, someone like Thomas Aquinas is going to say, for a ruler to try and use the Mosaic law uh, in their rulings, could be f fine and very good for their people, but to try and use the Mosaic Law as binding and authoritative because it is the Mosaic Law would be sinful, uh, because that is un trying to undo uh, what Christ did and undo what the apostles taught about what had been done uh, with the law, which is that it's no longer necessary for um, the individual believer or for civil polity. So what would be your response? Uh, I think, I don't know if you're familiar, there's a, there's a place in 1 Corinthians 9 where Paul says, mm. do I say these things on human authority? I speak on the law's authority. Mm. It's uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 9, verses 8 and 9. And he refers, and then he refers to a rather obscure law about regarding animal husbandry mm -hmm. to talk about why you should pay the people who teach you. Right. Don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Like I don't think farmers today look back and say, "Oh, make sure, you know, when you have ox treading out grain, or you right. have animals doing that work, make sure that you let the ox eat, because he's taking part share in the work." So therefore, right. Paul's saying, "Well, obviously, mm -hmm. I think it would. I think I could argue from this, from Paul's attitude towards using this, saying that right. Paul's assuming that, well, of course, of course, its laws still apply, and we apply them." more broadly than you even would have thought to. Yeah. I, d I disagree with that. I don't think that's the way that he's um, using it here. I think um, what the way that he's using um, the analogy here is you know, exact, exactly that. He's, he's making an analogy, which means it isn't even really uh, the law. He's not trying to bind anyone's conscience. He's just trying to refer to the law as an overarching principle, as yeah, as a as a metaphor essentially, um, and that as a pedagogical tool, um, and that's that's going to be one of the ways that the reformers say that the law is useful is by way of analogy as use as a pedagogical tool. But his point here doesn't seem to be that. Um, Therefore, we ought to have a law that um, oxen need to be treated this way and, and pastors need to yeah. be treated this way. He's talking about simply um, the, how, the how spirit right of the command. Is. Yeah, he, he yeah. is talking about the spirit. Yeah, I think what, is, yeah. the Westminster Confession of Faith kind of break the law up into like the three the three uses of the law. Yeah, and I think was it um, it was like Van Til or um, Aquinas or somebody like that that I think was the first person to say the law has a threefold distinction the civil the moral and the, the ceremonial uh, that's a good uh, question I mean it is a Westminster confession I mean it is a part of the reform I think, tradition I think they got it from somewhere I, it probably does go back to Aquinas saying they're they're taking everything that had yeah. come before them and processing it and, and saying this is this is what oh, oh, our yeah, churches that's hold the, to yeah, that's so, worth knowing I um I know that uh, the reformers held to um, sort of that definition yeah. of the law, and, but and, I don't know where it necessarily is and, and, first made. And, and the moral, the moral use of the, of the law in the um, from the law gospel camp, or from the kind of the Lutheran, um, you know, heavy law gospel distinction camp, right? Would say that the 
the moral use of the law in the new covenant is to uh, point us uh, to Christ, basically um, to show us our sin and therefore to show us uh, our need for Christ. And that's kind of like the the only use of the law morally, right? Mm -hmm. um, the the civil would be uh, something separate, right? For use by by princes, right? Uh, in the in the Lutheran position, mm -hmm. that the it's still it's still moral in a sense, but they wouldn't use that category, right? That would be the civil use of the law, uh, because you the the prince uses. Uh, it's not acting here as, say, someone uh, acting out of conscience. The con uh, conscience, they're, uh, um, conscience, they are simply acting as God's hand, in a sense, right? Uh, and then, of course, the ceremonial has been completed. You know, that, that was what Christ fulfilled and, um, and made holy his sacrifice, you know. So um, that would be the, I guess, the Lutheran position. Mm -hmm. um, and... Then those those people who would take more like a Calvinist uh, uh, Calvinist position would see uh, the continuing uh, use of the moral law in uh, uh, in the life of the Christian, right? It, basically, in sanctification, mm. right? Not full, not not. Uh, to earn one's righteousness, but rather to as a obedient response to salvation in faith. In right. faith, right? So that that's what made uh, you know Calvin Calvinist uh, teaching pretty pretty unique, <clears throat> and that the Lutherans kind of you know weren't as comfortable with that. Um, kind of the Lutherans kept wanting to circle back to justification by faith and yeah. all this. Whereas Calvin and others say, saw a theocratic impulse going on that this is still ongoing. And that, like, what I was thinking as you were talking is this is part of a debate in the in Dutch and Christian reform circles in the 20s. We have Huck, Huxima and others against the three points of Kalamazoo about common grace. Because then mm -hmm. common grace obviously gets you into culture. And they have the, you have the three uses of the law, show, law showing us our sin, showing us Christ showing us how we are to live now that we are Christians and then there's, there's a movement forward and Calvin says well then this I mean that's why he has this harmony of the of the of the law because he says he wants to bring this together because that's going to be part of how as you focus it through what Christ has done and what he's still doing because Christ is obviously still his kingdom yes is not of this world that does not mean it's not ever in this world that it's not actually functioning and happening, it's not leavening and going forward. And obviously within his times, the civil rulers were very much, I mean, Calvin wanted them to follow what scripture said. He, he wanted to bring about things that were scripturally founded and not just simply what, what, what the princes wanted for their own selves or what the um, other councils, the higher ups, the people who are rich said, Okay, we'll give them a little bit, but we're you know, we're not going to give you any of your money. We promised you thirty gallons of wine a year. You might get six. Maybe may make all these promises, but then he had, then he would refer them back to the law. And then what it is that they're supposed to do from First Corinthians nine is that you guys are supposed to pay me. You're supposed to what you have agreed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. But this is God's word, His law. Obviously, as it comes through more of a. The, the, the apostles, the disciples, apostles, right. early churches, obviously mainly concentrated in the church and in the preaching of the gospel. But then those things are going to go out, and then they may be reminded from Romans 14 that it's or 13 about you know fulfilling the law. Love is the ultimate thing, but it still has right. to do. You still don't have sex with a person who isn't your wife. You still don't steal. You still don't do all these things that right. Moses told us. You still don't do. Right. And the law has that sort of pedagogical value to uh, teach you that it's wrong and to... Uh, yeah, but then also how, uh, what to do when something wrong happens. How to correct it. Well, that's, well, that's the thing is the law, you know, actually inspires sin in you. It, it uh, I don't you know, think... teaches you to be covetous in all these ways. That's the way that Paul talks about it. 
Well, yeah, well says, it teaches that it is covetousness. How yeah. ought I have so he, known? You know, he says he wouldn't have had a knowledge of these things. Yeah, yeah he said, law. apart from the law, sin was dead. But then right. the law came, sin came alive, and I died. Exactly. Yeah, but it also caused sin to abound, in a sense, as well. Right. As, it, as, as if so It shows with, sin to be with exceedingly knowledge. sinful. With, right. But with mm-hmm. knowledge, I think with knowledge comes more of a, mm-hmm. a lashing out... Um, and it's, it's unclear exactly what the <laughs> the cause of these things is. I mean, the part, mechanism of, it, by that part of the mechanism that is just God gives us over right. to um, those things. Um, and we trespass against our conscience and we trespass sure. against the law. And then that right. you know, inspires grief, but then we continue to... Uh, my so dad gave me an analogy more. one time. He said, um, if you go into a dark room mm-hmm. and there's cockroaches in there, and then you turn the light on, so now you know there's cockroaches in there because you can see them. Right. Did the light create the cockroaches, or did it reveal them? Right, but I think that's not what Paul is saying. I think Paul is saying that being having these ordinances uh, taught to him, you know, they actually were, created they were, the sin. They were holy and they were true and good, but because he was a sinner, having these holy things placed on him just caused him to go deeper and deeper into his sin. As as and that's actually what the function of the law is for, is it actually um, it punishes people and it drives people further away from God in many ways. I think so, I think, but it, I think there's also a picture in the giving of the Ten Commandments, because God gives right. it twice, right? right? You sort of have, you have a, not you sort of, you have a picture of the Old and New Covenants, because mm-hmm. the first time God gives Moses the law, he takes them down, he sees Israel's idolatry, and then right. he breaks them, um, there's there's your image. The, the, the first right. covenant is the law broken. The second time Moses mm-hmm. goes back up, God gives him, and it says, uh, he gave him the law, and it's the same law right. written on the tablets. Do you, I don't know if anybody remembers what happened to the second set. They were put in the ark, and then placed in the holy, gone. <laughs> oh, well, placed in the Holy of Holies. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. So the second covenant is the ark, is the law placed inside the temple. Well, the temple is us united with God right, right. and it was placed into the heart of that temple yeah, yeah so the new covenant is it's the same law the question is is it is the law outside of me condemning me and killing me mm-hmm. or is it in my heart producing right. the fruits of righteousness right and so that's that's maybe where some of the key difference is going to be is what does it mean for the law to be written on the heart I would argue that the law being written on the heart isn't really uh, or primarily connected to actual knowledge and sort of conscience obedience to the law. That can, you know, that's that's actually um, that's what the Jews were attempting to do, the Israelites for their entire, you know. Um, I think Jesus career. would actually disagree, at least in a single instance I can think of, mm-hmm. where he tells the he tells the Pharisees. It's because you you don't the reason that you reject me and you don't believe what I'm telling you is because you don't believe Moses either, right. Right. and that cut to the heart of things because that's like okay now we got to kill this guy right. because he said the like the thing we're telling everybody is that Moses is basically tantamount to God right. and, and Jesus is coming right. along saying we hate Moses we have to get rid of this guy because he's sort of like he's he's found us out. Right. We have to also remember that when the, even in the giving of the law, it's grounded in gospel. In Exodus 20, it begins right. with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out, redeemed you. There's a redemption that's happening. There's a salvation. You're out of the house of bondage. Right. You're no longer in that situation, and therefore you shall have no other gods, all this stuff. So there, there is one of the ways it's been put, there is mm-hmm. law, gospel, law. Right. You know, mm-hmm. the... You know, the, the the one, in a sense, the first law kills, Christ makes alive through the gospel, and then he also then goes and says, you know, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. He's giving imperatives, he's giving laws, he's giving directives, he's, he's got a program which is beyond a narrow, get them saved, get them in church, and then they're done. get their money, <laughs> and this, you know, keep the program going, just keep it going, keep going, keep it going. And then that's it. No, that's again. That's supposed to those those things are supposed to be then internalized as people are taught the whole of Scripture. And again, as one person pointed out, Jesus did leave us with a pocket New Testament and and maybe some Psalms and Proverbs. He still left us with the whole thing, which was always say, "You, the Bereans, has said, Paul, what you're saying is what's back here." He didn't just say those are the Scriptures. Yeah, we we didn't. They didn't just read Gospels. I I, I favor. 
Gospels are written much, much earlier than our academics oh, uh, say. It's certainly, but uh, in the promises, you know, you see different hints of the promises and different parts of it all the way through, mm-hmm. in faith all the way through. But nevertheless, Paul does make this distinction between, you know, people were captive under the law, waiting for faith to come. And so there's this interesting distinction there where, well, you know, weren't they being faithful the whole time? Some of them, maybe. But there's there's still this uh, distinction that he draws between uh, being imprisoned by sin, by scripture, is, is the way that he says here in Galatians 3, uh, waiting for faith to be revealed, faith in Christ, and now we're free from that guardian and the ordinances have been abolished. Yeah. And, so, and so the whole Christian ethic, I would see, is you can't build some sort of Christian ethic around laws because then you're just going to turn into Judaizers. You're going to turn into uh, Pharisees when what Paul is, is trying to say is, you know, all of that was a gardened guardian to imprison people under sin. You're free from that now. Now you have the spirit, you have faith, and you have love of your neighbor. And so to try and sort of argue for certain things on the basis of Moses would be to defeat the the purpose, which is that the Christian acts yeah. out of the spirit. Well, okay, so we... If, well, and there's... there's uh, I, I, oh, I definitely want to hear what you have to say. Uh-huh. The, um, the, there's a, a wrong use of the law, right? And there's a correct use of it. The letter, obviously, brings about death. The spirit gives mm-hmm. life. And it's the spirit of the law that gives life. Sorry. But, uh, I mean, we all believe in the word of God, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we believe in... Um, the authority of scripture, right? Mm-hmm. Believe in the authority of God um, revealed in scripture, mm-hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> in, in a sense, that's the law of God, right? The, the, the law um, that is over other laws, mm-hmm. right? Um, so it, it, uh, it binds us in a way that when we do science, for example, when we, when we seek to know um, we we use principles that we learn uh, in in scripture, right? Uh, so cosmological uh, our cosmological pursuits um, are based on, upon p- Christian principles of who we are, uh, where we came from, and who God is, and how we relate to Him. So, in, in one sense, uh, we could say that. There's a theonomic position that doesn't um, claim too much from us, right? Mm. Uh, it, it simply purports that you know the Bible is the word of God, and and we live um, to to follow it, mm-hmm. right? Um, or you could take uh, the more philosophical per- perspective, maybe begun with uh, you know even even with. With Plato and the Neoplatonic position, Aristotle and uh, the uh, Aquinas and Augustine, and popularized in the medieval perspective, in the, in the you know in the medieval philosophy, that there is an order uh, mm. of of the cosmos, uh, this this uh, se- uh, sacred secret law mm. um, that is aligned with um, the scriptures, mm-hmm. um, because the same God cr- you know created both or or um, uh, revealed to us both right. of them, and, and in that perspective, the term theonomy and the right. um, the understanding of God's authority over um, the universe mm-hmm. is very much theonomic in that sense, right? right. So, I don't, right? I mean, yeah. we, we there's, can, there's different <coughs> sort of laws, you know. So you can talk about divine law, but there's a sense in which you know. If we believe that the natural laws are created by God, well, then that's yeah. divine too. But often, when people are talking about divine law, they mean you know divine positive law as it was mediate, you know, given by a mediator, given yeah. to Moses, uh, given to the Israelites for what I would argue is you know this very specific time of redemptive history, and not uh, not to be made identical with the sort of universal natural law by which you know all you know. All men know and are convicted that of what is good and what is right. Right. So you, you mentioned ethics earlier, though, right? right. So the, the question would be, where do those? We, we know that they 
uh, they ought to meet at certain points. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anywhere in Scripture uh, that we can see them meet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can see that the, the, the divine law revealed in Scripture and the natural law revealed in uh, experience and then the, um, uh, the law of God specifically used by Paul mm -hmm. to refer to like a Christian ethic. Right, mm -hmm. uh, a divine law for society. Mm -hmm. um, do we see that where, where any of those things meet? I think what we see a lot of consistency, mm -hmm. right? Because these we have the same Creator God uh, as the source of all these things. Yeah. Um, but where do these things kiss? Where do they meet? Where do they align? And if we see that over and over and over again, we we start to see okay, there's there's the law of God, right. and 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 how do we live our lives then right. in a way that maybe these things aren't law, civic laws but they might be principles yeah. um, by which we're to, to live our life um, and and so I think using the small t theonomy could be could be useful for that yeah. you know it, it, it all means what you mean by it and you know people are apt to carve out their own descriptions um Paul says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So he spends all this time in Galatians saying, like, this isn't, you know, you can't, you can't do this, you're free from the law, you, you know, it was you know, keeping you captive in all the sin. Uh, really, the law that you want to be following is what Christ commanded, which is, you know, bear one another's burdens, love your neighbor. That's, there's, that's there's, I think the law is helpful, though, in the, in the details. I don't want to say the devil's in the details. It's <laughs> not a good phrase here, but, yeah. um, like, okay, so you've got, you've got a neighbor mm -hmm. who's repeatedly coming home drunk. Right. And if you go up and you say to him, you know, why don't you treat others the way that you want to be treated? Do you think other people like being around you when you're drunk? And he's like, mm -hmm. my friends don't mind. Right. Is there anything in scripture that you could refer him to that well, says, well, no, well, it, it doesn't, like, your friends are not good friends. Right. Um, your friends have a very poor standard, and we can't base everything off of what somebody else says, you know. Um, I, I think there I is think a place. Generally speaking, course. like, yeah, you want to mm -hmm. treat others how you want to be treated, but then... Right. There's obviously disagreement on how people want to be treated. So, so what you're talking about is a situation when uh, you want to convict someone for their sin, mm -hmm. um, and I and I mean well, obviously not, well, and not just not just to that. convict him, but hopefully to turn him towards Christ. Right. What is the correct? It's not how do we keep you from doing bad stuff. It's how can we direct you to doing the best it's, things. Exactly. So, so I'm do. thinking in the Luther, in Luther's sense of the law is you know, uh, an instrument for, you know, revealing sin and, and, and revealing and the need for the gospel uh, in you. Well, let's say he's a Christian. So, if he's a, if he truly is a Christian, then, then I don't think there's any sort of lawyering that you're going to be able to do. I mean, you can, you know, it's certainly your duty to try and uh, speak to him and convict him of his sin if he's a Christian. But, you're, you know, you're not supposed to point to an ordinance or to a law because people who are truly Christians aren't under that law, but you can try and convict him by the Spirit and say, you know, you claim to be a Christian, and yet here you're manifesting, you know, sin, sin obviously the op opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. So, as Paul says here, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Seems like you're not being led by the spirit right now. Which right. And it seems, sort of going and it to seems place like the he's you. yeah he's he's behaving in a way because when we sin, that's incurring that's saying we want to be under the condemnation yes of the law yes. So I do, I therefore, do if we don't if we do uh, go by the the fruit of the spirit love joy peace yeah. patience kindness goodness goodness faithfulness gentleness mm -hmm. self control, then you, you know uh, where is it where Paul says. Um, do you have no fear? Do you want to have no fear of condemnation? Then do what is right, right, and that way you won't be under the law. Yeah, I, but I, I think that's um, you know who that man identifies as is going to change your your tactic. If he Certainly. identifies as a Christian, um, you have to warn him of like you know you are exhibiting drunkenness, and that is not what the Spirit of God gives. Um, and so you're clearly living under some other spirit right now, 
And so you got to you know, try to reach out to him and, you know, warn him of, of what he's doing, of, you know, is he going to follow the Spirit, or is he going to, you know, pursue all of these uh, sins and, and receive uh, condemnation from that. But if he's not a Christian, I, uh, I don't think there is any value of, you know, just some Gentile saying, you know, why aren't you following the Mosaic Law? you Gentile. I think that's um, sort of paradoxical, and that's that's why I think so many non-Christians react with hostility when a Christian sort of tries to get them with a verse or something like that, because mm-hmm. they don't have ears to hear. Um, and if they don't have ears to hear, then, you know, there's no point. Uh, I think Jesus is pretty clear on that. But if they, you know, are someone who is spiritually sensitive, who is, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, feeling the weight of their sins and, and knowing that they're doing wrong, then, then you, that's the opportunity to provide the gospel. So, I feel like there's actually very few instances in which um, going after a sinful person with uh, the law of Moses is is going to be helpful, um, especially if they're just you know some pagan out there. And I agree with that to an extent. We know Paul uh, in first, I think it's first Corinthians five and six, you know, really gets on to the Corinthians about, you know, you guys, you know, aren't we supposed to judge angels one day? You mm. guys can't even solve disputes among brothers and you're going to unbelievers to solve your cases for you. Mm. Like this reflects very poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like what what do I have to judge what do I have to do with judging unbelievers? Right. That's well, sort of an extra an extraterritorial yeah. application and, of the law. And I would, I would extend that to um, unbelieving rulers and powers as well, where it's not my job to tell this Caesar that he's not doing a good job, and you know he might be doing all these evil, unjust yeah. things. Like with the example of Solomon, um, Solomon, obviously there were, there were a lot of ways that he totally muffed it, mm-hmm. um, to put it lightly. And, but there were also other ways where God gave him tremendous wisdom in knowing how to apply the law in his kingdom. Right. And you have the Queen of Sheba coming right. along and being like, your wisdom is like, you get you get your wisdom from this God? Who is this God? Like, well, I want to know, because people have been telling me all these things and they didn't even tell me half of it now that I've come here and seen it with my own eyes. Mm. And I think that's God's design for us is we're supposed to govern ourselves so okay. well and we're yeah. supposed to be showing the fruits of the Spirit so readily that unbelievers come to us. Like, that's what it says in Zechariah 8. I, uh, I would, I ten, would ten men will see a Jew in the street and yeah. grab him by the sleeve and say, take us with you, for we've heard that God is with well, you. And I would agree with that, and that goes right, part and parcel with being a light to the nations. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. Yeah, and so so I, I like to use the, you know, the term uh, incarnational, right? So a good um, incarnational approach to the uh, example you gave about the friend, maybe um, the uh, neighbor who comes home drunk, um, one is is to give him the benefit of the doubt, and, and, and perhaps... Um, maybe uh, talk to his wife later? Well, no, 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 uh, perhaps not make the assumption necessarily that he's, that he's drunk, um, uh, so, like, you know, you, um, that would be the first thing, right, like, the first, the... Assume the best, right? Because knowledge is so fleeting. It's um, we are like be, understand that the world is sinful, meaning that it breaks the law. Like it's we have a we have a we had a world that uh, upheld God's law, right? And the, the part of the fall means that the very law of God in the cosmos was broken, right? Um, and because because uh, we understand that. We can come alongside him, whether or not he's a Christian, right? I mean, let's say you lived in a Christian world where you're, you know, every every uh, man was your brother in Christ in a sense, right? Uh, you know, uh, that's how we use the term Christian in a in a uh, in Christendom, right? And uh, so you come along your your brother and say, you know, you you, you should be drinking with me, um, you know, because then we can encourage one another and you know I, I i love you right and and at that point you're uh you're able to love your uh brother in a sense that you're not making a false assumption you can still look out for your brother and use opportunities um 
to show him how to drink in a way that he would not get drunk. You would um, be, be able to share the gospel with him if you, if you find that you know, this person has an addiction or this person um, is is depressed. And so you, you're at that. But how do you do all that? Like, how do you learn to talk in a persuasive way to your neighbor in a loving way in a way that doesn't scare someone off how do you learn to become someone uh who wouldn't uh that, that when you speak to someone they don't run off right. well you have to do that by um learning from the world around you right you learn that through wisdom right. and that wisdom is it comports to the law of god it, it yeah. reflects the law of god mm-hmm. so the in 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 uh, the incarnational method of doing apologetics, you know, uh, whatever you want to call this approach, um, is going to uh, be blessed the more we follow God's ways. But that's that's what we mean when we say theonomy, that we're talking about God's ways, right? So the most winsome, the most loving, the most inviting, the most caring, you know, charitas, the most loving way of... Uh, of talking to this person that may or may not be drunk is going to be informed by the law of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it so, also so we we we, we want to establish the law, right? <laughs> right. Well, yeah, Ro- Romans because it's so stable. Three thirty one. Right. Yeah, Romans three thirty one. It says, "Do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be." Um, the, that means forever. The, 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 Greek, never the Greek phrase there is a very strong one. He doesn't curse or swear, but he uses the most emphatic language in Greek that he can. May it never be on the contrary, we establish the law. And I think what something great that you mentioned earlier, Mike, um, about unbelievers are blind. They don't have spiritual eyes to see. Right. Um, what other way are they going to see the law established but through our lives and our actions? If we, we can say, oh, you know, um, you know there's the, the saying, actions speak louder than words. Jesus' problem with the Pharisees obviously was that they were adding a whole bunch of things that weren't there. They were nullifying other things that were... Making making divisions. Right. right. And then they were also um, not being not willing to bear those burdens with the people. Right. So their, their version of the law was just the letter. If there's somebody that's coming home drunk, you tell him not to get drunk and he's an idiot for doing that, and then that's as far as it goes. You don't right. have a conversation with him. You don't figure out what's going on in his life and figure out, okay, how can we set up some boundaries for you so this isn't is less of an issue? Maybe get an accountability partner. Like, can, can we talk about stuff? Tell me when you're struggling with these types of things. The Pharisees, that wasn't on their radar. It was, don't get drunk and we'll punish you if you do. We're not going to help you get out of it. Versus Jesus' example, which is, I'm going to help you with it which is also gives him teeth to be unhappy with you <laughs> when you don't. Um, what were you going to say? Um, that's the sort of thing, though, that I think makes me wary of uh, political theonomy, which would be um, if if we need to rewrite our law codes in order to be, you know, suitably, you know, applied, applied theonomy, even if it's not straight, you know, from the Old Testament still, we're rewriting everything. What that means is that uh, all the legal power goes to the clerics or the people who are authorized to interpret the law and apply it. So they would become the people who are powerful, essentially a new pharisaical class, and they would be the ones who are authorized to give readings and give interpretations. And there are you know, societies that, that do this kind of thing. That's what the Pharisees were trying to attempt. That's uh, the way that some Islamic societies work now, where they are led by... Um, scholars and the scholars who have the authority to give rulings on the basis of what they believe to be God's law and their, you know, application. And I agree that's dangerous when you have a uh, like a select small group of people. You mean like parents? That's how you. Uh, <laughs> that's how you wind up with right? the Roman so, Catholic Church. So, yeah. so you know, immediately when someone uh, like you like thinks of politics or uses the word politics, I think that immediately we tend to think in terms of nation states. Right. Right. And and, and it's like. You know, the, the, there's no reason that the word politics needs to bring to mind those type of things. It's you just that, household. Yeah. right. So, so I think it's always good to start with, uh, you know, the household, a family, and um, and maybe a multi generational type of family. Sure. So it makes things a little more complex, right? Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, the rule by parent um, is pretty sacred over mm-hmm. over the child, but the rule by grandparent. 
um, is is something that's a little more uh, harder to drive, right? Right. So um, if you have a small community in a, a home, for example, um, how do you what what sort of house rules would you want? What sort of right. principles uh, would you want? You would want to be informed by the Word of God, mm -hmm. and you, and you would want to speak, but you would you would speak in terms of wisdom, right? You speak in terms of the Spirit, yes, right? So I and you've also got totally parents talk, discussing things like. We've got this problem. We're struggling with this issue. Like, they'll, they will go talk to another parent and say, how have you dealt with this? Or do you know anybody sure. that has And solution? hopefully they and return to scripture. Right. Well, and there's clarity. learning yeah. and there's sharing of wisdom. And yeah. it's how to apply. But I think, apply I think the wisdom key. is never apart from scripture. The, the right. wisdom literature, in Solomon and others from Deuteronomy are saying, mm -hmm. as they meditate day and night on, on the law. this, not law code or not statute book, because we have our mind as statutes, and that's not the biblical mindset. It's not statutes per se, and there are some specifics, but it's it's it's, it's, it's always been a deriving of the wisdom, the learning, right. the teaching of Torah being brought through. But it's always it's always it's always wholly built from that, and there obviously would be cultural mm -hmm. things that are going to be a part of that, which you know limits it to some degree. But doesn't say that it isolates it. Yeah, and, that, yeah. and that's where people seem to make. Sometimes the mosaic thing sounds like you're making it. Well, this is just an isolated thing, and and we and we being in our new situation, we don't have to because obviously right now we live in a time where all of history is considered useless. Right. Because they're all by weight people and all that stuff, so we we can't learn anything from them anymore. Right. Even though we will repeat every single one of their mistakes, we we'll just simply have a new ruling class. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's, that's just always there to the ancestors, and that's um, you know a great way to just try and get rid of, of all wisdom. Um, and so, so I completely agree in terms of um, you know the believer, you know having at hand. In, in you know a thousand pages of wisdom to, mm -hmm. to draw from, and that's uh, that's something that's very nourishing and very good. But the moment that people begin to make ordinances uh, on the basis of that, um, they've sort of they've almost sort of lost uh, what was wise about it to begin with by by trying to um, you know, place these these commands that. Um, you know, Paul says we're not under anymore as long as you're being led by the Spirit. The person who's led by the Spirit is not under the law. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, we can just throw out our Bibles or something like that. Uh, it or just, just do whatever you want. It, exactly. We need to be doing what, what the Spirit wants. And Scripture can be a, a really helpful way of uh, discerning the will of God and knowing what God wants. But, but the power of it, you know, that's that's what we're concerned about, right? Is the the life giving power that, of God um, that comes from His Spirit indwelling us by faith, not from um, this sort of uh, you know deep knowledge and application of of the law per se. And that's what you know the Pharisees have gone after, and that's what many people. Uh, of a religious bent or of a conservative bent go after and, you know, they find themselves overthrown by sin um, because they didn't have the, the power. They, right. Well, I mean, um, if, if if we have trouble, and I, and I can see where the, the trouble would come, from, would come from, if we have trouble with the word law, law of God, mm. because of its association and... and it, um, with the Pharisees, it's, it's as not, unfortunate it's, it's as not, that is, it's not, it's not surprising. It's why you people. have a book like Galatians, and, and praise God that it's there. Mm -hmm. um, then um, we have to be able to make use of other principles, of other terms that describe the principles by which we, we function, even if it's writ small in the in the family or the small community. And so, um, <clears throat> when we have, I think. We use the term liturgy sometimes uh, in our in our church services because we we, we, we know that um, there is a very structure to uh, the foundations of the earth and the universe. We see this order in the world around us, and um, our churches our churches function that way. They function based on a constitution of, often. Uh, they have a, a laying on of hands, and and that's an authoritative. 
foundation for power. Mm. Um, and and so, even if we're afraid <laughs> to to apply the word namas or law um, mm. or statute to um, uh, to these these things, right? These structures that exist, mm-hmm. um, these foundations. Uh, we have to we have to call them something, right? right? And so I think that the 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 modern reform impetus to establish theonomy comes from seeing God's faithfulness throughout history through the use of these um, whatever you want to call them these structures, right? And so we ought to thank the Lord for them. We ought to seek to establish them in our lives, right? Um, and but we ought to, we ought to be careful uh, how we speak about them because if we simply just say, you know, to our kids that um, that yeah, you, you know, you need to meditate on the law of God day and night. Right. You also need to establish it in the Supreme Court of the United States. Mm. Um, if, if we say that without context, you could get something that's very pharisaical, right. it's, uh, very litigious, very um, problematic, legalistic, and, yeah. legalistic, and um, uh, so we, we we ought to be careful. So I I, I totally understand. Um, yeah, I think Michael's position on on this, mm. uh, but I don't know if it's a, there's an easy an easy way to do it because we right. we're actually. Uh, standing on the shoulders of, of giants, and there's all this terminology that we've inherited, and um, some of it has been really great. We don't want to throw the baby out the bathwater, so. Uh, and, and so much of it is this really um, deep, invisible thing that goes on in the heart, where the switch of someone who, you know, it's like, at what point am I, you know, totally faithful to God, loving my neighbor? filled with the Spirit, um, at, at what point uh, do I think looking back, like, oh, at what point did I begin just, you know, lording it over? Yeah, or seeking to obey the law by my own strength. Like, at what point did my faith uh, uh, fail such that now, I, you know, I find myself in sin. I have to repent. I'm like, this is, this is horrible. Um, you know, clearly, I've you know, quench the spirit by, by the way that I've just sinned. Um, there's, there's no, you know, it wasn't that I, uh, you know, failed to obey the law and now need to try harder to obey the law. And I think it's, it's that I need to have faith in God and be filled with the power of the spirit. And so I think that once we start framing things in terms of, um, how do, how do we, you know, arrange all the laws together so that we can obey them the best? It immediately uh, lends itself to being framed, uh, by, uh, lends itself to being understood as, how can I, you know, undertake all of these things by, by my own power, if that makes sense. There's a quote here that I, that I transcribed from a video series from Bonson, and I thought it was really good. I think it's applicable here, mm. where he says, and, and I'm afraid of all the exact same things that you're, that you're vocalizing, like right. where you go and you try to browbeat the Supreme Court into applying God's law against its will, and I don't, that's not how God mm. works at all. Um, so this is Bonson. An interest in the law of God and the principles of biblical morality is not contrary to a religion of grace, but is precisely subservient to a religion of grace. It's just because the Pharisees in Jesus' own day, who prided themselves in their adherence to the law, did not in fact keep to the law, but had diminished its requirements and really had bent it to suit the cultural tradition of of the day. Mm -hmm. It's just because they didn't keep the law that they had no interest in the Savior. Uh, Machen was right. A low view of the law always means legalism in religion because man's law will be substituted for God's. But a high view of the law, which shows us our error, our failure, our inability to keep it perfectly, forces men to become seekers after grace. Mm. For those who honor the law of God must honor the Son of God, recognizing that they have no standing in God's sight because of obedience to the law as much as they may try. They do not keep it. Legalism is avoided and grace is promoted when men have a high view of God's law. Dr. Machen says we ought to pray that God would again bring and make prevail 
that high view of the law. It's that which we're promoting this day. Mm. So I think the Pharisees' error was, they're like, okay, we can do this. We just need to tweak it a little bit. And then, we, then we're okay. Right. And that was what Jesus had the harshest words about them for. Right. Um, and I like the fruit of the Spirit. Obviously, when you, keep, when you keep the law, the Spirit comes. Or when you focus on the Spirit, the law sort of falls into place. You won't be violating it if you focus on the right. Spirit. And, um, and I do, you know, I believe that when Jesus came, he, he magnified the law. To you know, mm-hmm. he made it far harsher than Moses ever yes. made it. I was uh, just about to read from Matthew five. Yeah, I, I think that's very clear in uh, like the Sermon on the Mount and, and the teaching of Jesus. Says you know, um, you, you know, we can't even begin to uh, you know consciously wrap our minds around the, the, the holiness of God and just all of the ways in which we're. Um, you know, sitting and falling short in different ways. But, um, you know, the answer to that is, um, I think, living by the Spirit and not um, not some sort of you know, legal arrangement. Like the, the focus on, you know, trying to rearrange your life to be more um, you know, legal is you know, just a failing project. It's it's more helpful, I think, to focus on what's the goal rather than what's the stuff I shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the law does have both. It's like there are certain things in the law we're told to do as well as things we're told not to do. Mm-hmm. Um, if I can read from Matthew 5, and I'll, I'll end because there's a little bit of a twist because most people say, amen, 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 yep, 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 I like that. And then there's a point where people are like, oh, yep, see, Jesus is telling us to nullify that one. And I think... I think they've got it kind of backwards. Yeah, that would, that would be helpful to look at a specific example. Um, so Matthew 5, he says, You've heard the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Mm-hmm. So there's one where it's like, Yeah, don't murder. And Jesus is taking this a whole lot yeah. deeper than the letter. Right. It's somebody's like, Oh, well, um, I can hate this guy's guts and I could have a, maybe I can even have a plan for right. how to kill him as long as they don't actually go through with it. Right. I'm, I'm good. Um, so there's one where Jesus thinks it's rather clear to everybody that he's taking it to a much deeper, yeah, pervasive so, application than people would like to hear I mean, about. Yeah, it's sort of all through five where he's doing these like sort of extreme, um, making the law even more extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that is um, part part of his project to, to show that you know, the law can't be um, fulfilled a as savior. law. Yeah. Yeah. The law it obedience doesn't spirit. can't save. Right. Yeah, yeah you, you 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 could imagine someone reading this and say, okay, well, it sounds like um, we need to work on laws um, hate in crimes. regard to hate <laughs> crime and um, person's reputation, and so if they're a professional individual or a public uh, public uh, person. Uh, and the reputation is maligned, then you know there, there's, there ought to be p- penalties associated with that. You can you can see people doing that, right? right. And <clears throat> you could also not see what Jesus intended. He's but, trying to but, condemn the Pharisees, not give them more ammo. Right, but <laughs> right, but 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 at the same time, I think that we we understand that we wouldn't want um, to be canceled, maybe like right. So right. so um, how ought we to protect our brothers and sisters from being uh, you know? having their businesses canceled and stuff. Um, so like what are some practical methods um, other than the very general um, the the very general recommendation to die to self mm-hmm. right like um, <clears throat> he gives some he gives some applications right? so, so like these are the dilemmas that we that we face right right and we, we want people we, we, we think of uh, about our own situations, that, you know, I would die to myself if someone were to malign me. Mm-hmm. I would show the love of Christ by saying, "Well, you know, here's my cloak as well. You know, I'll, if you say that I'm that, I, I'm telling you, I'm not that. I'm not a fool. You know, you shouldn't have said rock on me, whatever. But, 
Um, but nonetheless, I want to go the extra mile mm-hmm. and let's let's talk, you know. And well, that's exactly 18, what Jesus right? goes into Matthew. right here immediately <laughs> after this. So getting into verse 23, it says, Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you. So in other words, to- your brother is murdering you in his heart or he's hating yeah. you. He's like, you need to reach out to him first. Make mm-hmm. friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are away- with him on the way. So that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you'd be thrown in prison. So in other words, he's saying, if you see something that's even going in the direction of somebody hating you, you need to nip it, nip it while it's small. <clears throat> um, so then he goes to the next one, you shall not commit adultery, and he takes it to a higher, more pervasive level. I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, he goes to the next one, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And then he goes another one. Uh, she shall not make false vows. And Jesus said, everything that you say should be on the level of a vow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And then the next one that people say, now this one Jesus nullifies here. And I'm like, what? <laughs> no, you're missing the pattern here. So you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go with him one mile, go with him two. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So see, right. Jesus is nullifying eye for eye, tooth for tooth. If somebody, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, you're not supposed to go for his cheek, you're supposed to let him take yours. And I'm like... No, Jesus is taking this in the exact same spirit, the exact same way. Because in the law, if somebody, let's say somebody uh, took a whip and whipped somebody across their back. Well, it's, you know, strike for strike. Right. You're supposed to take him to a judge, and the judge is supposed to give him the exact same penalty that he, that he gave you. Right. And Jesus is saying, not he's not nullifying this. He's saying that we're supposed to offer ourselves in payment of the wrongs that are committed against us. So if somebody slaps me on the cheek... Well, it's cheek for cheek, so the cheek's got to come from somewhere. And Jesus is, is saying, rather than me trying to get it out of the person that slapped me, I can offer the forgiveness for it, like in, in payment, in view of payment of that. That should be our attitude. So it's perfectly upholding and fulfilling an eye for eye, <clears throat> tooth for tooth. But it's at our own expense, right. rather than trying to get justice out of everybody else. We so you're, right, right, what you're doing is you're establishing... So let me just get, get the... Uh, yeah. um, it sounds like what you're saying is that he is not nullifying the law, but rather he is establishing it. He's just saying it's being fulfilled in a way we wouldn't think to fulfill. Right. A very right? counterintuitive, right. A in, painful in, in, way. In a, in, a, in a similar way that um, the Pharisees thought that the Messiah was going to come to, mm. to Take judge the nations. Right. And instead, um, the, the, na- the judgment of the nations was poured out upon the Messiah. Right. Right. So it's it's the paradox. It's so the, the payment. Flip, the right? payment is, is perfectly acceptable. So God. what you have in the in in, in, in uh, this kind of like transcendent view of the theonomic position, I think that, that mm. I think you're presenting, is that the law of God is being established, but it's been it's been like um, reversed, or it's been. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't know what the proper term uh, would be, but it's fulfilled it's, or completed. It, it, it's fulfilled, but it's, it's, requir- it's requirement. Is it's been being turned inside out in a sense. It's transformed. It's right. been transformed, yeah. like this covenant yeah. transformation. And uh, but but then again, we we have the dilemma of talking about it because um, we don't have we, the, the scripture doesn't offer us a handy term to re- refer to. The Uber law, or something, or like the right. alt, the, the pseudo law. Well, there's the, there's the law in the heart, is what I would say. And so, um, <clears throat> it's so I that think, I, I want to meet its requirements, even if you won't. I get to, I get uh, to be merciful because Jesus said, "As we forgive others, we'll be here's forgiven." Here's the thing: I think the fact that Jesus is making these incredible, extreme versions of the law is it's sort of uh, depending on how you look at it, one one side of the coin or the other. It's either this. You know, complete establishment of it, or a kind of nullification in a very specific respect. It's nullified in the sense that um, the other we, person doesn't suffer. The other person doesn't suffer, and he's so creative in his um, 
uh, transformation of it that this isn't the sort of thing that we would be able to uh, discern from that law without it, without keeping in mind the you know the very core of it all, the very spirit, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Which means that you know Jesus is saying here, so you take the punishment for your neighbor. But um, but what I I don't think that means is that you know we need to be combing through uh, the Mosaic Law, looking for more things to uh, do a Sermon on the Mount style of per se. Uh, consciously, what I think is going to happen is that if we're living in faith and by the Spirit and with the fruit of the Spirit, that sort of thing is going to be happening all the time, where there could be all these sorts of connections between uh, you know, what the Spirit leads us to do and um, you know, things that are, that are said in Scripture, and they might not be conscious connections that we make, but they might still be there, but we're not doing it because we, we read it in the law and it's like, okay, here's going to be my tricky ninja way of applying the law in this situation, it's more, you know, the Spirit is leading me to love this person in a very specific way, and then it turns out after the fact, this was this was exactly the kind of thing that Jesus was talking about, of, uh, f- you know, fulfilling the most extreme form of the law in its most transcendent mm-hmm. sense. sense. And, and I agree, I agree to an extent, but also I think, I also don't want to overestimate my ability to be spiritual. <laughs> mm-hmm. Obviously, the Holy Spirit enables me to do those sorts of things, but then there also is a requirement that God's put on me to study His Word, to read daily. Um, the illustration that my dad would use, it's not like, um, if I want to read and learn from the Bible, you don't you don't like rub it on your head, right. and it like magically transfers its wisdom into my brain. I have to, no, I have to read, I have to study it and think about it, discuss it, um, like that's how God has given us the ability to learn. That's the yeah. means that God wants us to do it through. Mm-hmm. Can He put things into people's heads? Yeah, He can give somebody dreams and speak to them in visions and stuff. Right. Does He say that that's going to be the norm? I don't think so. I think the way that Paul talks about in terms of studying and applying wisdom, uh, even the Psalms and Proverbs say, "With all, with all you're getting, get understanding." Mm-hmm. It's not something that God just Straps into your head, yeah, wirelessly. See, see, that's that's something that I would disagree with. I think there can be just immediate spiritual transmission. Of there, there can. I, well, and I, yeah, yeah, there can be obviously dreams and visions and things. But I think, I think if we demand that God speak to us in those sorts of terms, I don't think we have the right, right to demand that. Right. That right. We have. Right. We do have an obligation to go about the normative way of starting, yeah. studying and learning. Yeah, I, I think that you have enough uh, in the development of the early church, right, in the epistles um, specifically, um, where um, a certain practice is established. This is how we're going to do the... Um, this is how we're going to distribute charity to the widows. This is how we're going to do the Lord's Supper. Um you know, this is what we're not going to do anymore. We're, you know, we're, we're not going to uh, eat food sacrificed to idols. Um, you know, unless, of course, it's nothing. You know, like there's the, right. there's all, the, all these. Right. So you, you you get these instructions, right? Mm-hmm. And so we don't want to simply say that these instructions are kind of like the Christian law of God, right? Like right. it's like I mean that's that, that's often what people think about when they think of Christian theonomy, right? Mm-hmm. Like Christian theonomic practices means that the church kind of establishes a new Torah, a new like. Uh, uh, Levitical system, through, right. you know, with its own with its own priesthood, in a sense, it, you know, um, and but it's the law of Christ now. I I, I see the mm. the potential danger in that, but at the same time, um, so we don't we don't want something like that. But what right. what do we want, and how does how is it orderly? How is uh, how does it stand the test of time, and how does it reflect the glory of God? Whatever that thing is. Mm. Um, and it's probably, I do believe it will be de- decent, uh, decentralized, and I do believe it will be uh, something far different than we can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I believe it will be something that we could potentially refer to being as you know, God's way right. uh, for living. And, um, and it will be definitely informed, and it will definitely be informed by uh, uh, 
by the study of scripture right. and the applying of, of of study, but often I think by analogy, right? Mm-hmm. So what we're talking about is is um, uh, applying it, maybe not directly, but we're applying indirectly. But the, there's still a certain directness. That the directness comes from the Spirit, which gave the law in the first place. So there's this type of indirectness, mm-hmm. right? But there still is very much a direct application of the Spirit of God. Right. Well, and I think it's helpful to, to remember that the, it's the things that are immaterial and unseen that are real. The physical world is the shadow. And so when we talk about people, people will say, oh, well, you're spiritualizing. You, would, you say that there's a temple today and we're priests that are working in the temple and we're also the sacrifice. So, like, the te- right. there's a fully functioning temple. You're spiritualizing all that stuff. You're making an excuse for how not to say that we have to be still doing animal sacrifices in the temple today. And I want to say, no, what they had in the Old Testament was the shadow of the temple. We right. have the real thing now. Right. And that was an illustration that God gave us. Um, and even still, I'm, I'm a shadow of my of what I will right. be in heaven when my in, in, in my um, glorified eternal body. So epistemically, my question would be: when we're you know looking through these um, shadows of things in some ways, um, where different you know, different commands, different statutes, um, thinking of that as you know it is reflective of. You know God's work in this uh, world, His work to the, the Israelites, but you know, every Christian has to be, you know, I, I would think following from Paul, they have to be convinced in their own conscience about um, what what they're doing, uh, when when they're doing it, and and that's you know. That's the work of the, the spirit in them. I think it, it works through the conscience, and it can work through through all these different things. You know, uh, you know, knowledge and study, and you know, the exhortation of you know other believers around you. You know, these are all ways to get at knowing God's will for you. There's these many different ways in which God's going to communicate to you. But um, at the end of the day. Because they're shadows, I think that um, attempts to try and like take them uh, and then apply them to your specific situation could turn out to be really wooden, unless you're you know hmm. actively being empowered by the spirit to do so, and your conscience is sure, and you are you know filled with power and conviction, and there's all this. I have a story related to that. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot just about the, how messed up the American justice system is. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I would love to learn more about what goes on locally and figure out what are the real problems that people are struggling, struggling with and figuring out how can, how can I show, how can I work out my faith in fear and trembling so that unbelievers can... I know this sounds like a stretch. Look to Christians and yeah. see a good example. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, for sure. But in in my early attempts of trying to do that and look back at them now and just, wow, this is really stupid. So, like, mm. uh, there was a town I was living in where I was like, I would love to sort of pick the brain of my local, um, what was it, sheriff? Um, oh, maybe he was sheriff. I think he was just recently uh, community servant elected elected sheriff, and I was like, I would love to talk to him and get his take on like, is he a Christian? Right. Why did yeah. he get into law enforcement? All this type of stuff. And so I went with a, with a letter for him, mm-hmm. and I I thought, and this is going to sound really stupid, but this is what I went through my head. Well, I don't want to just like be a leech on his time, so I want to give him a gift and just say thank you for what you do. If you have time, like I, this is a request, but the gift is free. So I went up and I took, I, I put, I put some money in this envelope, to, and I tried to hand deliver it to yeah, him. Uh, and when you go into a city and you try to give them money yes, at the well, city yeah, building, that's, like that's well, really, <laughs> I know now that that's very much frowned upon, and they right, right. Oh, all, yeah. all kinds of, laws. of <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of I, well, and I wasn't, I'm not even sure, is it against the law or they just, anyway, the heckles came up. Yeah. And I As was sort of the appearance of of like trying to bribe yeah. the sheriff to do something for me, and I'm just like, I just want to know who you are. Um, but yeah, so that's a, I mean, that's a, there's some there's yeah. wisdom that I learned in in doing that and trying to figure out. Okay, 
Um, you know, what are the real issues of, of our day that we, the church should be getting to the bottom of, mm-hmm. which oftentimes it yeah. tends to ignore. Others mm-hmm. I've talked to or have talked about similar situations with fellow Rich Bledsoe in Colorado, connection to Jim Jordan and Theopolis and things like yeah. that. But he talks about, I mean, all he does, he would go to, well, first of all, so getting together with ministers in the town mm-hmm. and getting together and working out the schedule. But then just saying, just come in and say, I want to meet with you just to talk to you, pray for you. I'm not coming here asking for a single thing. But give me 15 minutes out of your schedule, whatever it is. Mm. We'll meet. And as things develop, and he, he's developed relationships with people and in the university community. And he says, you know, if people, well, yeah, I think he gave, no one will last more than like, Five years as a president of the university, <laughs> because of the first couple of years, you've got all the goodwill. After that, it's all the people who want to tear you down. And if you last longer than that, you obviously sold out from the very beginning. But it just, but it's that kind of thing. But again, no money, nothing. Just saying, I want you know, what is there a problem you want to share with me? It stays entirely with me. Obviously, you got that kind of confidentiality as a minister. Mm-hmm. You have, you have that as part of your situation. And he just worked things out. He's in Boulder, so he's he's not in a little town. You know, he's in a major. I mean, the place that's worse than California, in many in many ways, all by itself. Mm. He says, yeah, oh, "Yeah, Boulder is Europe in in America." Well, but, but it, it is that. It's just it's not a single thing. I'm not coming with an agenda. I mean, yes, he does have an agenda. He wants to see him come to Christ, but. I'm not doing this in order to get something on you or for me to owe, right. you to owe me a favor. No, I'm just here to pray and then walk yeah. away. Right. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that we're we're always going to have in the church age um, a sort of cognitive dissonance between um, what we understand, our freedom in Christ, right? Uh, our um, <clears throat> the the, the under- whole purpose of this discussion is because like, I'm hoping that we have disagreements. We will have disagreements. Yeah. That's what makes things valuable to discuss, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think we ought, to get, we ought to get comfortable with that because we want to follow Christ. And the more we seek to follow Christ um, from generation to generation or from day to day even, um, the more we're going to, to see patterns. We see certain patterns work. Um, and it is not just a scientific, uh, empirical investigation too. We're not just looking for patterns. We have time-tested um, ways of living um, that we can uh, apply to our lives, right? So, in many ways, we see the law of God, the ways of God in uh, in our experiences, mm-hmm. um, and we seek to to have these spiritual habits, to have these. Uh, life habits but we want to do so in a way that is not rote we want to do so in a way that's not wooden we want to do so in a way that is not uh, legalistic or litigious or we want to do so in a way uh, that is um, dead but we want to be alive in Christ right um, so much of and so there's this cognitive dissonance right between not wanting to uh, uh, establish the wrong law of God Right, but in a sense, the, the 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 right law of God, the true law of God, the revealed law of God, and and, and my way of understanding theon- theonomy, and the way I, and the reason why I don't mind it is because I I look at it from the perspective of the resurrection. The law was buried and died in Christ, but rose again on the third day um, as something completely. New and different, just like Christ's body, mm. which had the scars, it bore the scars of his life. Mm. Uh, and, and so therefore, it's, it very much reflects um, as it once was, mm-hmm. right? So it's this, it's, it, it, that's the paradox we live in. And that's why I don't really mind the, the, the term, um, because I, I, I know that some people are using it in certain ways, especially some people use the term theocracy. I know they're, they're using it in a way um, uh, to establish some sort of Christian renaissance, for example, um, uh, in real time. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, but but I will I will walk with them. I will go the extra mile with them because I want to see 
um, the the proper application of this idea. Right. Uh, and at least you have a place to start with them, right? If, if you're coming from this type of community, right? You have a you you have a we, this is the type of community we live in, or um, that has right. been familiar with these sort of discussions. And and you know, if it gets people reading scripture, then they're. <laughs> They might actually encounter some wisdom if they are reading with, you know, eyes that see and ears to hear. Uh, and so, if, you know, if their goal is to uh, obey God to the utmost that they can, then um, there will at least be uh, a lot of wisdom that they. It's just common encounter. fruit from that, right? Well, yeah. we, we we understand that there is uh, fruit in um, the establishing the obeying. Of the Ten Commandments in mm-hmm. a home or in a in, in a city, um, but um, immediately you're going to start to have ca- uh, uh, cases, right? right. Um, that where you're going to hit exceptions, <laughs> or, yeah. right? Ambiguities, and, yeah. ambiguities, and so you realize, okay, um, these are, these are these are bones, and we want flesh, mm-hmm. right? And the how do we flesh this out? Oh, I know, case law. You know, Deuteronomy, right, or something like that. It's like, well, that's just the beginning, right? That's just the beginning. We actually need the flesh of Christ, so that's why we must partake of Christ. So I'm so thankful that at our church we partake of Christ every single week, right. because every time we're doing that, we want to put flesh on the bones of this dead law. Mm-hmm. And so even in our sharing of the Lord's table, the bread and the wine, it's like the law of God is proclaimed, mm-hmm. just in a new way, right? Right. It's also helpful. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think that that sort of the mystery of that, um, we we don't know all the ways in which God's law is is operative, um, and I think that there's there's so many respects in which you know uh, we'll figure you know we'll find that all out eventually you know, in, the, in the resurrected life how it all uh, ties together, but in terms of our um, responsibilities now. I would just want to be uh, very cautious about how we go out about trying to do things like intentionally. Like, well, it's my you know, form the sort of intention that I'm gonna like an intentional community. Yeah, we need to be very cautious about how we well, really? well, do that. The cool thing, the cool thing about my my way of thinking about this. Gary North wrote an article years ago called "Bottom Up Theocracy," which I really like that term. Anyway, the website that's related with this podcast is called VoluntaryTheocracy.org. Mm-hmm. So it's I think most people they're like interesting name. I don't want anything to do with you, but that's a very interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's. Where, where you said we have to be careful about establishing it, and the, I think the cool thing is that, coming from my perspective, you don't have to be careful, you have to be willing to learn from your mistakes and applying it. Mm-hmm. Because um, there's obviously people that are going to be ver- that are going to be very receptive to mm-hmm. God's law and God's commandments, and there are going to be people that are very hostile to it. Mm-hmm. By and large, I think God's design is that the people that are poor that have been oppressed and have suffered injustice, they're going to be very receptive to God's law because now I'm coming in to try to help them solve this injustice and I'm going to bear the burden with them. Right. And they're going to be like, this, you, this is amazing. I've had atheists tell me, Adam, you're doing God's work. Right. Um, that is direct. Because quote. you were just there loving them. Because I was right. there, I was right. helping somebody with a meth addiction and I brought them into the house and they lived with me for three months. Right. And we read Bible together and they still ran out on me and they forged a check for me and did all this stuff. And I was just like, well, you know, God still has a story left for him. And this person was just like, I'm, I'm blown away by your attitude towards this. Like, you're going and doing things. And now, I didn't do a perfect job right. ministering right. to this guy. Right. But who else is doing anything? So in that sense, I don't have to be careful. <laughs> it's like, there's right. nobody out there doing this. Jesus said that the fields are ripe for harvest. And there's the problem is that there's not enough workers. Right. Um, versus... Obviously, Jesus was uniquely qualified to go in and condemn the Pharisees and start smashing tables and chasing people out of the temple with whip um, because he he did walk the line absolutely perfectly. He's the only person who ever did or ever could. Um, in that sense, I would have to be very careful if I wanted to like walk into a church and start assaulting the pastor during the sermon or something right, like right. that. Like That's basically the equivalent of what Jesus was doing. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, when you're serving those people, uh, the primary desire is, wow, I just, I, I gotta love people. Jesus really wants me to love people. I've got to go and do that. 
and I want to minister to them and you know, try to uh, bear their burdens as best as best I can. But you know, I don't think your goal can be you know, I I've, I've got to try and get this uh, person to follow the law um, because that's that's not really what the that wasn't Jesus' attitude at all. You're, I think, I, yeah, I agree with you. Jesus is not just trying to show people by example, saying that, you know, when he cleanses the leper, he's like, go do what Moses told you to do, like, for your cleansing, go show yourself to the priests and all this stuff. But Jesus gave him, gave him the healing and says, now that you've been healed, go and do what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, when... when- when Jesus spoke to the centurion, the centurion gives um, an example of um, of his his authority, mm-hmm. um, and Jesus looks at that um, positively, right, mm-hmm. and and looks and and uh, affirms him right. because he's giving an example of his own authority, right, right. and and so um, what. I believe there's a relationship between authority and accountability because wherever there is an account, yeah. right? Whenever there is an account, there is give, there is take. Uh, and it's overall, are you in the positive overall is what an investor wants to hear. That's right. That's right. And, um, um, so, uh, I believe if we're going to have true accountability. Um, we're going to have to start talking about, um, like a, ju- a just application of, of some account, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and when we start to do that, that's where we that's where we come into uh, the most difficult dilemmas of establishing the, the church or Christian societies, mm-hmm. um, because uh, immediately we hit these ambiguities, uh, and um, and people want to split over these things, right? Yeah. And so um, part of we always want to see it from the side of and we ought to, from the side of the widows, the orphans, the victims, the the the, the, the downtrodden, the poor, um, and and we ought to. Jesus did that as well, right? Right. But um, as a parent, <laughs> uh, I I have to also consider um, the, those people who must force others, or I, I guess not force, but must um, persuade others to. Uh, keep their vows, mm-hmm. right? To keep their vows, you know, that they voluntarily entered into. Um, and when when I'm doing that, I think I'm pointing back to uh, the authority of Christ, right? Mm-hmm. And that's another way we, uh, uh, I guess, establish or apply the law of God th- through the Spirit in the new uh, spiritual, mm-hmm. new covenant sense, right? And um, by by rebuking people, uh, you're speaking. I, I, I'm saying one of, one of the ways that we apply rebuking. I, I, well, rebuking would be one way. I mean, I think that Christ leaves uh, that that is a, uh, definitely an option for the Christian to rebuke others, mm-hmm. right? We ought to uh, we ought to do those within the church, mm-hmm. right? Um, out, outside of the church, um, I think that um, our interactions with people should likely be. Um, limited in the sense that um, whenever we're outside the community, we're we're strangers. We they're need to strangers. take care of our own house first. Yeah, and hopefully they'll be drawn yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's um, there's going to be opportunities, especially if you are the stranger, right? right. Uh, and you're the stranger in, in, in the other world. Uh, maybe you're in um, Babylon or something, right? <laughs> but then at that point, are you gonna you you know you have the very difficult task. Of presenting this analogy, to say, "Hey, your law should be loving others like me." Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you have a huge task, right? The prisoner who said, "But Daniel did it." I mean, you know, uh, and he was able to do that. Yeah. And- <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question, though. It's like you know, when Daniel was, you know, in charge of all the satraps or whatever. You know, did he go along establishing, you know, the Mosaic law for all of the people of Babylon? That, I think he probably knew it would be futile because as soon yeah. as he's gone, they're going to go right back to because <laughs> yeah, they don't have the law in their hearts. And he's, he's yeah, he's under authority. He has the emperor to answer to, and so he's going to institute you know, Nebuchadnezzar's law or whoever. And that's that's his obedience. You know? right. And I think that when it comes to matters of uh, 
have a civic law like that. Uh, but then you have Jesus. Joseph as a as a sense the counter to the, or not a counter but as an alternate. Mm. Joseph becomes head. I mean, second in command, second yeah. command to everybody, and he brings all of the world in a sense under his authority, that, which is oh, under Pharaoh's certainly. authority. But, but, you know, but Joseph but, but, didn't but it, have the Mosaic law to well, make but he, all of well. Him. Yes, we're yeah. you know, to a certain degree, but well, he, Joseph did the more important thing: is he brought his bro- his father Jacob, mm. who then witnessed and testified to Pharaoh, and mm. Pharaoh was converted because mm. that's the significance in Exodus one about there was a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Now it doesn't mean he did poorly in history; mm. he didn't know, but no, he knew not the God of Joseph. So again, mm. Egypt was brought under. God, I mean God, God's authority, His control, right. everything, and and what they did was, you know, they brought everything under. Now, yes, the mosaic, and I want to make a couple comments towards that. The mosaic, again, we we get caught into this. Moses' law is by is like a, is is like the code of law that we hand to the police mm-hmm. and the lawyers to do. It's a bunch of statutes. It's a bunch of this. Many of the laws are all, uh, largely deal with issues of cleanness and uncleanness. Mm-hmm. They don't deal with fines per se. I mean, there are things if you if you're if you're bull gore is another one. You have to pay a certain amount. If there's in the habit of doing it, both of you are going to die because mm-hmm. you had the you have the mental intent, the men's ray, to know that that bull was going to gore and kill something or another person, and you didn't stop them. So again, these concepts of everybody, many of the laws are about clean and unclean, and all you had to do is, you know, wash twice in, uh, in morning and evening, and it was over and done with. And many other commandments are so you shall not do this, but there is no penalty. Mm-hmm. And then there's also one, there's also one uh, punishment, but it doesn't tell us what it says uh, for whipping. It says, if you're going to whip somebody as punishment for something, no more than 40. Right. Which and then, means, and then that's that's why they went to 40 minus 1. But also the other laws it. were to make sure that if, if he took your eye, you could not take more than his eye. The limitation was placed. And now Jesus turns that around or transforms that, a better term, and says, like, like you were pointing out, if he takes your one eye, to give him your other one. You don't have the right to re- demand of him because, um, again, mine's the law of it. And most people in many situations would say, wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, the idea of not even defending yourself. I mean, you don't even have to go the whole Anabaptist way to, right. to see that. Um, it's just yeah, the other change, but it's, it's the kind of law. People nowadays only hear it in terms of statutes, in terms of fines, in terms of all these things and building these, where then the rich then use the system to game everything so that they. Never pay anything. Right. The, little, you know, the, the guy who gets one ticket, he doesn't pay it on time. He gets another fine. He can't go to work anymore because he, his license is taken away. Whereas the rich guy, his son, can blow through 16 breathalyzers and still be driving the next day. Hmm. Well, we've got a completely, you know, we've completely lost the whole mens rea aspect of it. And it even gets even worse in, in, hmm. in, in, in politics and in, in, in hate crimes where... The only only one group has a men's ray has a reason to hate, and it's not the people who are mm. pointing it out. Mm. There's another there's another issue. Obviously, if somebody takes your eye, like that's that's right. a very that's like a body part. You don't get body parts back. Right. Um, but there's one example there, and I like to take it to its full conclusion. Um, you know, when somebody takes your tunic, give mm. or takes your cloak, give me your tunic. And the first time I thought of that, I was like, okay, is this a backhanded? way to get back at somebody so that way you can go to a judge and say hey officer he stole two <laughs> two things from me hit him twice as hard and then I was like where did that thought come from no it's the opposite it's where um, like imagine somebody steals my shirt mm-hmm. and I give him uh, I give him my jacket then I go to the police mm-hmm. and I say I, and I don't think I would be prohibited from going to the police I could say hey officer he stole this from me well okay now let's do an accounting he stole a shirt from you, and so he owes you an additional one. Well, where did he get that additional one? The jacket that I gave him. So now I get back everything that was mine, and I think at the judgment, that's how God's going to do things. We're going to get back, we're going to be repaid, and, and and much more than everything that we ever gave away. Um, so that when, when the judge comes back and he's like, okay, 
uh, you stole a jacket, so you have to pay a jacket. So give him back the one you stole, and then add a hundred percent to that. So now I got my shirt and jacket back, and the other guy is no longer a criminal, and he's right back to where he started. I'm right back to where I started. But now there's a spiritual, there's spiritual credit that I built up. In other words, this guy's going to be thankful and grateful for what it's I've a, done. It's a creative way of it's a creative way of uh, interpreting that you know like this account, and I think that that works. I just don't think that. I don't have to be the, the yeah. important. I'm not the accountant. God's right. the accountant. Yeah, that, well, so that's my what, duty is to give. Yeah. And I, I know this guy's going to owe somebody yeah. a jacket later because God is yeah. going to. to right, judge and, that and I would be I would be careful to to try to apply Old Testament law in that way over and over and over again because I I, I suspect that um, it's. It's not always going to fall in line that, sure. that well, right? There's sure. so much more uh, mystery there, um, uh, and and I think the the part of the theonomic position, or I guess not the theonomic position, but the the, the part of um, uh, like soteriolo- soteriological uh, theology um, that has um, interests me for years and years, but I've never um, kind of finalize my position on the subject is uh, how um, uh, how exactly God looks at um, the severity of our of our sin in terms of uh, the um, just in, in terms of justification and atonement right and so what exactly uh, is our is our Penalty, right? We know it's hell, mm-hmm. right? But um, like, how? And and we know what we are given right. when we are when that uh, when we're forgiven, right? We know right. what propitiation is, is payment for that penalty, mm-hmm. right? The wages of sin. That um, way, God doesn't have to just wink and let people into heaven. No, your your admission was paid for, right? But then, but then again, it, w- w- once we start uh, thinking about the transaction. Right, substitutionary atonement in this way. Then we start thinking about okay, well, what is the relationship between the Son and the Father? Uh, we know that there's this eternal covenant, right? And the the Son um, offers himself like a, the Isaac, you know, to Abraham. Um, but what does the Son owe the Father? Christ owes nothing to the Father, um, and so and, and so how? But how does his perfect light? Life. Mm, I would say merit. the son owes his obedience and life to the father. Yeah, but is it an owing in the same way that we, the same way that we owe God, well, or that the Adam? The there is, there is, there's 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 a lot of a lot of questions. Yeah, there's a lot of things um, going on here, right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't want to get too too far off the topic, but but um, it's it's important to realize that we probably aren't going to ever get at all of the perfect. Mathematical answers to these questions right. about uh, soteriolo- soteriologically, right? Mm-hmm. On, on the subject of uh, salvation theology, but and, you, you seem to be driving at like the judgment according to works, um, right? And I'm saying that in the same way that we are trying to do that with soteriology, salvation mm-hmm. theology, we often I think do that with um, Christian ethics, mm-hmm. right? We want a, a, a mathematically precise way of understanding. Mm-hmm. The Old Testament law sometimes, right? right. Uh, and understanding what it was ex- exactly that God was establishing when He gave us uh, the the you know, the two t- the two tables of the law, right? Uh, why was it two and eight? You know, why were these two particular uh, two copies? Uh, right. Yeah, and, and, and we want to say it's because of this and this, and 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 it was to establish this perfect society, right? We have a, we. we it, it, we see utopianism as like a balanced budget, right? Mm. We, the, like yeah. so Christian utopianism is sort of balanced legal, but theonomic budget or something. And I, I think if we if we resist that, it frees us up to better appreciate our position in the church age. Mm. Um, and and so anyway, I, I, I will bring up sociology to, to to mention that. Well, I think there is I, I think there is ultimately balance. God's God of balance and justice and perfect scales. But God's also alive, and that's one of the things that I, that was sort of striking to me. There's, I'm, I'm writing a book, um, and I'm in, in it. I'm examining some of the death penalties and like going in through and trying to like neatly categorize them and, and shove them into these little things. But you start getting into it, and it's like there's so much overlap 
and this one refers to this one, and like, well, wait, these are totally separate categories. And it's like, as I'm as I'm going through and I'm wrestling with all of these different laws on death penalties, it's like, it's like this is a like a little baby chick that I'm trying to wrestle, and it's like getting out of my hands, and like I can't kind of like hurting cats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's like it won't be contained. And it can't right. be neatly categorized. And these are the death penalties, and that's how alive they feel. Yeah. So sometimes when I and so it's like there's balance there, but it's also this is balance and life, and there's a circle, and it continues on and repeats and iterates on itself forever. And there are the reasons of things that are happening that, in a sense throw it off. I mean, it's like the frames triangle. There's the law, there's the you no, know, there's the law, the situation and the person. Law, situation, ex- existential. Three different, you know, the three different things. You're always having to look at what does the scripture say? What is the situation we're living in? Or what is the you know, the culture we're living in? But then there's also you. There's, you know, how are you involved? How are you favoring perhaps the rich and not the poor? How are you doing things so that you're, you're using the law as a club instead of using them to, in a sense, point out how Christ would have you live these things. I mean, just even that Matthew 5 passage about the eye for the eye. I mean, yes, some of these things are also things that were owed. If someone sues you, you've obviously got to give it. But then Moses also said, well, if, if, you, if you go into debt to somebody, they can take your coat during the day. But they have to give it back to you every night. Because that's so all can, you got. Yeah, that's all you got. But you have to give it back. You can't keep the coat and sell it out to 20 different people as part of your pledge for the money you borrowed. So there's all there's all these things you have to be ask, asking. One of the things you can't just simply say, you know, there's like you know three charts as to these things. If you're guilty of one one thing here and two things there, then you get this penalty. Or is there a, a joke about men who mess up? And a guy said, I, I broke my wife's gravy bowl, and they're looking to see which flower it is. And at the bottom it says, break gravy bowl, see jewelry. <laughs> I mean, how, yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> there's different, different things that happen. And a similar thing with the law. I mean, the law, I did, you know, some training for paralegal. It's just, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out what is the person's intent at the moment they do or don't do. Like, mm-hmm. assault doesn't require anything to actually happen. The other person doesn't even have to know that you plan to hit them, but that you had the intent to do it makes you guilty of assault. And now that becomes the way to say, you use that word, you intended to hmm. hate me, to hurt me. Well, no, <laughs> hmm. that was my intent. I, I, I was just singing a rap song. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, sometimes well, I've had the book Theonomy and Christian Ethics for a long time, and, and you know, sometimes when I read Bonson on on um, you know this applied law of God. I, I sometimes envision that he's looking at like this utopia that we might see in something like a Magna Carta, right? The the first you know, civil law for the West that's uh, supposed to apply universally, right? Or at least you know to to um, uh, the commons, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and, but I, I think that he's trying to look at scripture um, like as a ledger, though, right? And so, I, I, again, I, I think that we need to be careful to, to see um, the, the Bible as having to conform to some ledger uh, of, of like some sort of Christian utopian society. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I want to see justice, mercy, um, uh, and humility in the world. I want to see it... Um, established in our uh, communities, our families, and, and so on. Um, but I don't necessarily think that there's. I don't think there's going to be a manual to do that. And I saw that in. I don't know how familiar with Christian Reconstruction. We were talking about Christian Reconstruction earlier, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I think it was George Grant was the editor of the series about bringing in the sheaves or something. Uh, no, God, the blueprint. The blueprint series. Yeah. The blueprint series. And I think that that was published by uh, was it, the um, uh, Christian Institute for Christian Economics or whatever. Probably. Yeah, well, yeah. Gary North's many organizations created yeah, yeah, in the yeah, 70s. Yeah, Dominion. <laughs> it was called, yeah, yes. I think he had like Dominion Press, I think was the name of his press too. Yep. Um, but, uh, uh, but, I mean, you could see the what they were trying to do. They were trying to uh, cover, like, every area of life. It was, tr- tr- it was supposed to be uh, tautological, right? Yeah. Well, like, and those Jews, they have no idea what they're doing with the Talmud. Hey, let's write this thing. I know, <laughs> I know. And, 
and and and, and as, as as soon as they started it, I think they realized how difficult it would be, it'd be to finish it, and yeah. it never was really finished. It was yeah. kind of kind of fizzled out. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think you're ever going to be able to keep up with you know thousands of years of rabbis or thousands of years of like imams who have been trying to do the same thing. When that's the that's what Judaism is, and that's what Islam is. It's this religion of law. Where you know we gotta all, hash this out. We gotta solve the Bible. We gotta yeah. solve the law. Yeah, it's an Very equation. Well. And, yeah. These, and you know, yeah, what would we have you do our with best men on it? And the scholars come <laughs> up with the official, you know, fatma or, or reading and on, about the, about blockchain. It's like okay, yeah. so what is a uh, you know a just view of blockchain tech blockchain technology? Yeah. Right, yeah. everyone has access to it. Uh, you have to you know confirm the entire registry. Uh, and the only the most recent registry is considered the authoritative version. And it's, it has to be fifty one percent majority, or over fifty percent majority is whatever. So somebody could theoretically change it, but they would have to alter about fifty percent of all the computers online. Right. And so so okay. So there's a perfect democracy through the blockchain or something. I don't know. But um, uh, you know, instead maybe we love our neighbor enough to not you know use that technology at all right Mm. because if he lives next door to us we don't why don't we just go over there with like some milk and then they can (laughs) give us some eggs and like that's way that that's loving your neighbor like to me um part of that down to earth (laughs) christian reconstruction though is is also owes a whole lot to the whole Kyperian, you know, there's there is believing and non-believing science. They, you know, you mm-hmm. the, the, the believer and the non-believer. You're either rooted in regeneration or you're not. And all the things are built. I mean, the Kuiper does that, and then Van Til takes it up. And, mm-hmm. you know, Bavink, the Kuiper and Bavink are they're both living at the same time. They have a little bit different vision. I mean, Kuiper is a great big thinker. Bavink was working his way through, and he's very much more open to contemporary society. Yeah. Kuiper is just blowing past it, but he's in, but he's also but he's also then in the government. He's doing things. Also, I mean, Bobbink is also in one of the houses. So I mean, it, there's all this stuff going on. But that's part of what Van Til and Rush doing. The rest are saying, okay, let's fig- let's get some of the global the global skeleton. You have that Foundations of Christian Scholarship book, which takes all the major academic things, Poitras writes, Frame writes, Bonson writes, all these different people, right, under their, in their particular fields. Okay, what if, and again, it's, it's funny, is I hear today in some of the things Doug Wilson says, same things I heard Gary Norris right. saying in the 80s, what if the government finally realizes we are completely, totally, utterly bankrupt? Please, step in. Yeah, but it's it's what well yes there, there ought to be because again we are dealing with a we are not dealing with a tiny little piece of real estate in the Middle East you know sixty miles by forty miles and that's all we have to be really yeah. concerned over concerning we've created a goal that is so a goal a world that is so interconnected that you then do need to come up with a system so yeah, right. but again and you're trying to figure and to use one other thing you have to figure out what are the things that people cannot not know. The Jay Budashevsky book about natural law. What are those things mm. which we as imagers of God cannot not know? And then getting that agreement. And then I think, you know, the Christian reconstruction can be begin to be worked out. Yeah. But again, that was that was the vision. I remember just those all those books in the eighties and nineties. And so and so much of the uh, of that was based upon this idea that there is no new there's no yeah. neutrality. Right. Um, and therefore if any you know, if anyone says like, Oh man, theonomy, you're just gonna get a bunch of Pharisees or whatever, well the alternative is, you know, academia. It's uh, the, the yeah. trust the science, humanism. right? Right. It's right. secular humanism and and they're working from the scientific method or empiricism mm-hmm. and and the, which is a know, lot better than I think uh, the Christian approach, which is just sort of do whatever you feel like uh, feels good to you. Yeah, go for. It. Jesus wouldn't want to deny you some pleasure. And, <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, it's like because it, it gets down to it. I've been looking into like uh, parole officers, how, how they think, and are, do they really feel like they have a, a solution? What they're doing is good or it's working. Um, somebody was telling me about. Talked to my dad. He was a parole officer. He retired. Was a parole. I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, There's somebody was telling me about a minister up in Coeur d'Alene called Good Samaritan, and the relationship that they built with the city up there. Because now the city looked like you guys have an eighty percent success rate. 
can y'all teach us some stuff? <laughs> you know, like, isn't that all a Christian wants to hear? Yeah. You know, could you please come in and teach me how you're able to get people out of, out of our cycle of right. going to jail? Because right. uh, we're running out of money trying to do this, and we don't know what else to do. Because mm. our our programs have like an eight percent, and right. you guys have an eighty percent success rate. So, like, how do we? It's it's all a question of how do we get to where we have unbelievers saying, "Could you teach us, please?" Yeah, mm. yeah. I I I think that um, so there, we're I mean, not going to do it necessarily. We're, we're not, not to say empiricism is what the world has to operate on, and or that's it's what we now, need to give them. Right? Nowadays it's called effective altruism, right? Uh, these, uh, uh, or nihilistic altruism, right? That's the most mm. black pill version of, mm. uh, of empiricism and rationalism that currently exists, right? We're just like, you know, um, we're doing this uh, to preserve our genetic information long enough so that we can preserve the fittest genetic information, which is very likely plant life or something, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and we need to. So that's At the only reason. Honest. So humans <laughs> exist to figure out a, a way to pres- to destroy ourselves right. uh, most efficiently, so that yeah. the, the the best life lives. Which is, you know, probably fungus. Or, or the yeah. transhumanists that want to upload themselves to the cyber. Right. Yes. So, but 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 that, that 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 itself, like trying to find like what is the most what is the fittest genetic information. What are you trying to get at? You're trying to get at the law of God. You're trying to get at the supreme law, right? Mm. Because when we, because what do we say when we say God God is beautiful, right? Or God is glorious? We're saying that He give me a he, mathematical equation for beauty. Well, what, what we're saying is that He conforms to an ideal, right? Um, or that, but He is the very ideal. But in this, when, when you're doing that, when you're making this comparison, what you're doing is you're applying a law. Right, mm-hmm. so like the, the law I think is good if you use it lawfully. There's this unavoidable application of law, right? When we establish a word, say like, well, I'm going to use this word over and over again, and I uh, I understand that you're going to interpret it um, in the same way, right? Because we have the shared language. I think that we mm-hmm. just we just uh, that's a law in itself, right? It's like the law of language. Um, so it's like it's in the very um, makeup of the air around us, right? I mean, that w- law is all around us, mm-hmm. right? It's definitely not this, you know, Christian theonomy in the theological historical sense of the word. But again, you know, I want to uh, embrace the idea of law of God. Mm-hmm. And the only alternative is the law of God, right? Yeah. It's just that secular humanist perverted form of it. Right. And so... Um, and they reject so, so the source as well. Yeah, you know, you, you can have a sort of society that takes nature into account. Absolutely. Versus, you know, social attempts to go against nature. Right. Uh, which you want to reject. And, so, sure. Yeah. That's an important with that. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it's for the sake of the church, but it's also for the sake of the world. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, for God so loved the world, you know. And, uh, and so, we're supposed to be his instrument in bringing right. the world to yeah. Christ. And, and, it's, and that's why I think the two-kingdom approach, right, the Escondido mm-hmm. approach, uh, the Dutch approach, is, is so problematic because they, they look at the, uh, at the world as something that is void of the spirit except by common grace, mm-hmm. right? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, and and I, I think that actually Christ came into the world and he sent his spirit into the world and actually the embodiment of that is the church. It is the church. And so uh, no, no discussion of how ought we to live, right? Because, you know, many... Uh, any theonomy discussion is going to have this question, you know, how shall we, you know, how then shall we live and so on, um, is going to have, it should take into account the position of the church. Um, even if you live in a, even if you understand this world to be in a post-church era and that the church is uh, deceived and that we're backwards, nonetheless, uh, the spirit is in the church, right? Because the people of God are, are in the church. And if the spirit is there and his word is there, then it can be renewed, and so semper reformanda, or mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, as as uh, Augustine said, you know, let's build the city of God. And it's not necessarily the intentional community, right? But it's like right. the intentional parenting or the intentional friendship, you know, because that um, you want to, you ought to be intentional in everything you do, right? And every word you say. 
And I know that's not what people mean when they say, I want to start an intentional community, right? right. They, they, you know, they often mean a, you know, some sort of governance, maybe. <laughs> right. I, I think, you know, there's different ways to cut that. There's a sense in which I would agree you should be intentional about things, depending on what you mean by that. Um, you should be, uh, I think, some people, when they say be intentional about everything, would be to remove all sort of, like, spontaneity uh, out of life. Um, and I think there is a place for just uh, immediate action and... I always intend to be spontaneous. <laughs> I'm like, every moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, then I think we're on the same page. So. And I think the serendipitous, too. Yeah. 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 Well, so there's like God. a little uh, ironic twist to it. I think the, the biggest thing that takes, honestly, some of the unbelievers that I've actually talked about with this, believe it or not, I've talked with unbelievers about this stuff, and there are probably some that are listening, um, they're, they're intrigued by it because I'm not coming to them unhappy mm-hmm. with how they're living and mm-hmm. trying to tell them things that they don't want to hear. Right. Um, I'll do that to a believer, ho- uh, hopefully much more readily right. than I'll do that to an unbeliever because I right. want we're supposed to be concerned with managing our own affairs first. And I think that's one of the main reasons that unbelievers can't stand Christians is because Christians we've done managed such their- a yeah. bad job yeah. and now we're coming in trying to take over way yeah. too early. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and so it's like not only is or we, what we coming in with bad information because we obviously don't know what we're talking about. Right. But then we're doing it the wrong way on top of that going to them instead of them coming to us yeah, which I, is supposed to be the ideal I think that's very um, wise and so it it's sort of takes that. it takes a lot of unbelievers off guard because they're like so you really don't care what I do I'm yeah. like no if you hurt me like I'll give you stuff <laughs> but it, basically that's right. the spirit of the thing and they're like huh, I like you yeah. <laughs> I don't like the other guys so much yeah and so in that sense, there's really nothing that can hold a candle to God's kingdom. Because what can you, you know, you, you slice your enemy's leg open and he gives you an, his spare sword. Mm. Um, and it's like people, there's nothing that can beat that spirit. Yeah, that I, I do it's undefeatable. Yeah. Um, that's, why, that's why I didn't really like the newest Star Wars movie so much. Ah. Palpatine figures that out. I'm like, no, that's not what the evil guys do. That's what the good guys do. He's like... I must, I must die so I can be reborn, and you must sacrifice me, and that's why I can never be killed. I'm like, no, that's what Jesus does. That's not what Satan does. <laughs> Satan can't grasp that. He hates that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I personally um, don't take the uh, this position, but I, I would love to hear what the the hard. Christian theonomists would say about a lot of what we've said, uh, especially the ones who believe in a hard uh, self-defense and a very, uh, the uh, militaristic um, use of the law of God, uh, either civilly or um, you know, personally. Well, the open carry people in um, this yeah, church. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because because you know they have still unbelievable these, to me. Well, the institutions, <laughs> the the. the the institutions you can use that, that in live defense, under and defend yeah, somebody defenseless yeah. Yeah, <laughs> on somebody else's behalf. Yeah. The, yeah. Insti- the institutions the we live under um, are are that very position externalized, right? Um, and so, um, I mean, not everything about them, but a lot of uh, you, like the unbelieving things we live under. Yeah. So the you know our our, our nation states, for example, have um, a monopoly on the use of violence um, on, on that highest. Uh, form of the use of violence, mm. and we um, we believe that that is just, or many many Christians believe that's just because um, you know the, the law of God. Because right? the American Revolution, and what else? Do you well, have well, and, and, and they would they would probably go all the way back to uh, some sort of view of Christian ethics that's they, they might call theonomic, Hopefully. right? Otherwise, it'd be hard um, to have a dis- discussion with them about it. Yeah, and that's and, and what I'm saying is that I think that. That um, there, that, that's maybe one thing lacking about this dis- discussion is that 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 position probably hasn't been defended very well, or I mean, introduced and defended very well. Uh, and I wouldn't know where to begin necessarily. Um, it's been 
too long <laughs> since I held that position. But, but, but nonetheless, but nonetheless, you know, that's I think it, within Reformed churches, that's uh, uh, that's the reigning position. Uh, not among everybody, but among the leadership and among among the most influential. And so uh, we're uh, we, I think we have a lot to contend with. Uh, but we, if we do so with love, I think that love wins. So, <laughs> real love, real love, yeah. Not real love, homosexual yeah. love, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is an oxymoron. Yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah. I think I should probably head out. All right, it's getting close to bedtime for me. Thanks uh, for coming, Mike. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. It's really good. Oh. Dennis, it was yep. nice to meet you. Yep. Good to meet you. Thank you, Dennis. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> you guys are welcome to stay if, if anybody wants to stay. Yeah. Well, Michael's my ride. <laughs>